Welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this weekly program. My guest for tonight is a good friend, Dr. Kenneth Howell. He appeared on one of our first programs, sharing his journey home, focusing on the place of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and how that helped him in his journey home to the Catholic Church. I've asked him back for a couple reasons, one of which is because we work together in this Apostolate the Coming Home Network and you might have a question about our work in terms of helping Protestant clergy become Catholic. But also I ask him back because hot off the press is his new book called Mary of Nazareth, in which in this book he tries to explain the Catholic teachings about Mary to a non-Catholic audience. We plan to talk a lot on Mary tonight, but in our preparation for tonight's show, as Ken reviewed his journey home, we both were strongly led to realize that the topic we needed to focus on tonight was one that was very important in his own journey and one in which is often misunderstood, both by many Catholics and non-Catholics, and that is the place of suffering in our lives, the importance of suffering, the problem of suffering. But specifically tonight, we're going to deal with suffering, the redemptive aspect of suffering. I want to remind you that you're a very important part of the program. Your calls and emails are very important to our discussion. So if you want to take part, would you call us at 1-800-221-9460 or email us at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Ken, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Marcus. We it's work together to as uh, associates, and yet we have to come all the way to Alabama to have a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> How true, yes. <laughs> Previously, when you were on the show, you shared your journey with the mm -hmm. audience, and you uh, you can't cover a whole journey in just a short time, but you focused on the place of the realization of mm -hmm. the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. For a moment, maybe recap that aspect of your journey. Well, I think that as the Lord reaches out to different hearts, you find that um, he uses different avenues yeah. and different, uh, some people the Blessed Mother comes to in a very, very yeah. real and special way. In my case, it came through a very quiet study of the scriptures um, about the doctrine of the Eucharist. And when I began that study, uh, now it would be about, uh, well, almost seven years ago, I had no intention whatsoever of becoming a Catholic. <laughs> but as I was a, at that time a Presbyterian minister and a theological professor in one of the Presbyterian seminaries, as I began to study and to teach on the doctrine of the Eucharist, I slowly came to understand that the scriptures do indeed teach and that the church has taught for, well, 2,000 years mm -hmm. exactly what the Catholic Church teaches today, that the Eucharist is indeed the real body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ our Lord. In coming to that conviction, I realized that I needed to begin my journey to somewhere, to destination unknown. Yeah. But as I did that, and as I began going to Mass and understanding, there did come a point in my life, one particular day, when I looked at the host, at the priest held up before us, when we were in the Mass, when I realized, as he said, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, I realized I believed that, yeah. that this man, or this man Jesus Christ, this God-man, is the same one who is now present in the Holy Host. Mm. And of course, to come to that point, not only with my mind, but also with my heart, mm. was to come to a point of, of no return. Yeah. <laughs> because I knew that I didn't believe that before, and I couldn't go back to teaching something less than the fullness of Christ's presence in the Eucharist. So that was the thing that really drew me, first of all, into the church. And that issue especially for many of the men that we work with, is uh, a struggle not just because they recognize they can no longer teach anything but the fullness of the real present, mm -hmm. but then there's the struggle of the praxis oh, yes. of what we're doing on Sunday in the pulpit with sacraments in which we recognize are not the fullness of the, mm. of the Catholic Church's teaching. So it puts mm. a real tension there in it our does. lives. Parallel with this aspect of your journey was also uh, encounters and growth in your own understanding of the power and meaning of suffering. Yes. And we <coughs> talked about that earlier, and I, it's not something that you shared before on the program, and we thought 
given the fact that many people have questions about suffering and its place in our spiritual journey, it just seemed just so appropriate for you to talk about it tonight. Mm -hmm. Maybe for a moment, it'd be good to talk about how you viewed suffering before, how you taught about suffering as a Protestant pastor. Well, that's a, that is a very difficult subject because um, there are many different views among Protestant Christians about suffering. Uh, in my college days, for example, I went to a, a church where, in essence, the message, if not directly in words, was certainly implied that no suffering comes from God. Mm. All suffering is from the evil one. And if you are undergoing suffering of any type, and by that I mean physical, emotional, financial, of any type, yeah. then there was something wrong with your faith. And uh, the problem was you needed to believe God more. And I cannot tell you, Marcus, how many Christians I have seen absolutely devastated because of that teaching. In, in my own ministry, we talked earlier about how that happened also in my own ministry where a woman in her 30s was dying of cancer. Yes. And the prayer group comes over to pray for her healing. But their answer to her and to her s struggling husband was that the problem here is that she doesn't have enough faith. Mm. And if she had enough faith, of course she would be cured. And that went on and on and on until she died. Mm. And then the prayer group kind of broke up with the conclusion as well, if she had had enough faith, she wouldn't have died. And the husband is distraught. Yes. Yes. And his comment was, but she's been healed. <laughs> she's been healed yeah. in the fullness of her resurrection. So well, this concern about suffering. Uh, well, that, that, that is, a, that is a one view that's out there. Now, I didn't personally do, right. hold that view. I moved more into what we might call mainstream Protestantism. And in that, uh, there is a slightly different view. For example, uh, Paul says in, in Romans chapter 5, mm. he talks about suffering as something that gives endurance in our lives. And like you, as a young pastor, it's interesting, the first church that I was a mm. pastor of, I was 25 years old and most at least 80% of the members were over 60 years of age. Uh -huh. So I performed a lot of funerals during that time. And, uh, but, but one particularly strikes me, a, a woman in her 30s who died of cancer like this. And most of us don't realize how many people are undergoing that kind of suffering every day of their lives. Well, in, in going through this, I didn't try to console her with the fact that she might be healed. We prayed, of course, for that. But if God chose not to, she was ready to go to heaven. But what I often emphasized with the, was the fact that, rightly, that suffering can produce character. It can produce perseverance within us. And in some way, it can eventually work out to our good. But I must admit that even though I knew this in an intellectual sense, I had not integrated this into my personal life at all. Because whenever difficulties or problems came, boy, I would get just livid because, you know, what's God doing to me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so even though I knew it in my head, I was not really, um, I had not really embraced the idea that suffering could be valuable. I should remember there's an old Calvinist mm -hmm. joke, right, about things keep happening in this guy's life and he just, you know, at mm -hmm. the end says, all right, I'm glad that's over, let's move on. In the sense that from a Calvinist perspective, we mm -hmm. saw this suffering just as a part of God's yeah. kind of plan for our life. Mm -hmm. It was to happen, it was a hurdle to get over, let's move on. Mm, but not seeing yeah. anything deeper. And I think that's what we've come to see from the Catholic perspective mm. of suffering. Mm. What is it in your own journey that opened you up to see the more fullness of the Catholic perspective on suffering? Well, you remember a few moments ago I told you about the time when I was in church in Mass and I heard the priest say those words, this is the Lamb of God. I understood something about the Mass that I hope every Catholic knows. And that is that the center of our life is the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the cross is no less a part of our life than the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And I understood that the Mass was bringing that sacrifice of Calvary to us there today in the 20th century. And so as, we, as I understood that, I began to, I could not quite articulate it, but I had a, a definite sense that the sufferings of Christ were much more a part of Catholic life and therefore should be of my life as I was on the journey to become a Catholic. Well, what happened was I met a, I met a wonderful priest in Jackson, Mississippi, where my home was at the time. 
and he offered to give me spiritual direction. So over the course of a few months, he introduced me to the wonderful spirituality of St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Order of the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. And um, through reading the spiritual exercises, I came to realize that in the Ignatian spirituality and in Catholic spirituality as a whole, the cross of Jesus Christ is very, very central to our lives. Mm -hmm. So in the summer of 1993, I decided to go on an Ignatian retreat. And, uh, and going through this retreat, in the third week, you're supposed to meditate upon the passion of Jesus Christ. And so you begin with the Garden of Gethsemane. And I meditated upon that, and I kept a daily prayer journal. And I went back uh, some time ago, and I read that prayer journal. And here's what I wrote during that week in the summer of 1993. Lord, I'm a little over 40 years old, and I've never known any suffering in my life at all. My life has been on cloud nine. And yet I see from the scriptures and from these spiritual exercises that to be a Christian means to embrace the cross. It means to embrace the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to do that will be a means of salvation for the world. I said that in my prayer. And yet, I, I almost didn't know what I was saying. Yeah, yeah. But I remember I wrote this, Lord, if it will help redeem one other person, help me to share your sufferings. You know that, before you go on, so that prayer that you just prayed is a powerful prayer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a prayer that we should be willing to pray. Yeah. It's a, a prayer that we should be willing to pray, especially, let's say, when we're reflecting on the sorrowful mysteries. Yes. If mm -hmm. my suffering in some way can bring one person closer to you, mm -hmm. then bring mm -hmm. it on mm -hmm. and help me by your grace to receive and to accept. Yes. So there's the prayer you pray. The pray, but sometimes you have to be careful how you pray. <laughs> I would warn anyone <laughs> that's a dangerous <laughs> prayer to pray <laughs> because what you're asking God to do is to open up his heart to you yeah. and to show you what he wants you to do. Well, I had no idea because it came in the most unexpected yeah. ways. Yeah. First of all, we, we fell into, because of a loss of job in my journey to Catholicism, we actually, I ended up with a loss of income mm -hmm. and with a wife and three children, and that was quite a, quite a loss. Yeah. So that was the first step, but then the second step that became very, uh, very painful was that our oldest daughter during this period of time came out with a very severe illness. Mm -hmm. and. Um, almost came to the point of death, or so we thought at the time at least, but um, I, I can now understand something of the sufferings of Mary as she stood by and she watched Jesus on the cross. To watch someone you love suffer is harder than suffering yourself, I think. And so as we watched our daughter go through this very painful illness, it, it took me and my wife sometimes to the brink of despair. We often didn't know what we were doing. Well, through all of this period of time, and we had moved and, and all kinds of changes within our lives, um, then things began to look a little bit better. But then one day, uh, the most uh, unexpected event happened. In the spring of 1995, I was um, not yet a Catholic. But I was definitely on the journey and, and very close. Was it known that you were a Catholic? Oh, yes. It was, well, I mean, that's the, that was the problem. Yeah. People called me Catholic, and I wasn't even Catholic yet. Yeah. I mean, I was on the inside, but not on the outside. I it, wasn't formally a member of the your, church. Let you losing your job. And that's right, all yeah. of that. Yeah. But the, the thing that, uh, that became such a, a powerful instrument of God was that uh, as I was teaching this class, one day I was going back to my office. Um, to uh, tidy up some papers after the semester was over. And there was no one there on campus, hardly, because it was the summertime. As I moved along the street close to the building where my office is, there was a young man sitting on the sidewalk very close to me. And as I walked past him, I noticed that he had a large, heavy winter coat on. And I thought to myself, that's rather strange in the middle of June. It's a beautiful day. Uh, why would he have this coat on? But I didn't think much more because I was in a hurry. As I got past him, just a little ways, I heard the loudest sound I've ever heard in my life. I thought it sounded like a car backfiring. 
And, and yet I knew it was too loud for that. And as soon as I turned around, I looked at this young man about 25 years of age and he had a gun pointed at me. And he pulled the trigger again. And this time the bullet went through my neck. Did you recognize the young man? I didn't, he had glasses on. We still don't even know today who he was or why he did it. But in any case, um, I mean, I didn't know what had hit me. I just took off running down the side of a building. Only later did I discover from the police that he came after me and shot at me three more times, mm. trying to kill me. Mm. As my brother-in-law, as a policeman, said, on that particular day, that man wanted to get you. <laughs> yeah. And um, mm. and you know, and the questions began, well, why? Yeah. Why would this man want to shoot me? Mm. Well, I told the police my life story more than some priests know about me. <laughs> and. Um, and they, they tried to discover what would have been the reason, but they couldn't find any reason at all. Um, I went into the operating room, and it turns out that the bullet had gone through the cartilage that holds my vocal cords together. Mm. So I lost my voice. Mm. I remember hearing about that. We had the whole Coming Home Network praying for you because, yeah. well, I mean, it's one thing, everything uh, to be shot, of course, and, and to lose your voice, but as a minister, as a preacher, <laughs> as a teacher, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we thought there was also other aspects of the, your whole commitment of life was proclaiming the gospel. Yeah. And in this act, your voice might be taken away. Yeah. That thought ran through my mind, too, yeah. as I laid there in the hospital bed. Um, but, you know, people on the Coming Home Network, and literally I had friends all over the world praying for me, Catholic, Protestant, yeah. just people that, that had whatever religious faith they had. Mm -hmm. People prayed for me. And all I can remember is that one day I was going into an operating room and they were fixing up my vocal cords and then four days later I awoke from being sedated mm -hmm. and I had this sense, it was like you're, you're here with me. I could feel the angels mm -hmm. standing around me. Mm -hmm. The presence of God was that palpable. Mm -hmm. And I knew it was not because of any virtue of my own. Mm -hmm. I knew it was simply because of the prayers of God's people. And I'll never forget the words of Psalm 51 that came back to me that's in the daily office of the church. It says, Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. I <laughs> said, God, open my lips and I will praise you for the rest of my life for saving me. Because I didn't know it at the time, but that bullet missed my carotid artery by two millimeters. Mm -hmm. If it had hit my carotid artery, I most certainly would have been dead in minutes. Yeah. As I laid on that hospital bed, I said, God, what, what, have you, you know, what are you doing with my life? And yet at that moment, the grace of God was so powerful that I really didn't ask God why. I just said, what do you want me to do with my life? And as that was the case, I realized that somehow God at that moment was answering the prayer that I had prayed in 1993, mm -hmm. let me share your sufferings so that somebody somehow may be closer to you, may be redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, I know that the, uh, the, the answered prayers that we realized in the Coming Home Network as a result of that changed lives because mm -hmm. we saw a, a miracle in terms of God uh, yeah. not only giving you back your life, but here you are talking. Yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. praise God yes. for that. Mm. Um, the whole Meaning, be, on the one hand, behind the incident is a mystery. Yeah. We don't know the man, we don't know why and all that. But yet there's another aspect of that suffering that has great meaning. And I know mm -hmm. that that event, for example, also helped gel your own family in many yeah. ways. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, and, and, and maybe even in helping you eventually make some of the decisions on the journey no, into no. the Catholic faith. Mm, it did. Um, suffering is such a big issue. And I know because suffering has had this part in your life. Uh, what do we mean by redemptive suffering? That's what your prayer was about. It was, yeah. That you could suffer so mm -hmm. that your suffering somehow could help another person. Mm -hmm. What do we mean by redemptive suffering? Well, I think that the, the most um, vivid and, and capsulized form of this is actually in a text that I'd come across mm -hmm. earlier in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 10, where Paul says this, we always carry around the dying of Jesus in our body 
that the life of Jesus may be made known in our body. And Paul is, is saying there, it's interesting, he doesn't say that we carry around the death of Jesus. He says we carry around the dying of Jesus. Mm -hmm. As if Jesus, as it were, is still dying within us. Mm -hmm. And he makes it very specific. He says it's in our body. It's not some ethereal, disembodied suffering. It's or in real. Our memory. Or in our memory. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's real, physical, maybe real emotional, hmm. but it's, it's real suffering that goes on. But notice what he says, the purpose of that experience of the death of Christ is so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. One time I spoke upon this in the Protestant seminary and one of my students came up to me and he said, you know, what you just said, it says in the book of Mark, in the Gospel of Mark, that when the centurion saw how he died, it said, surely this man was the Son of God. It was how he died. And it's often how we endure suffering or pain, or disappointment, or whatever it is that's in our lives that is an instrument of showing others the life of Jesus within us. It reminds me of the verse in 1 John that says, uh, perfected love dries out all fear. fear yes. There is no fear in mm. love. Mm. And in that description, it's talking about how love changes us, the love of God, our love for God. Mm -hmm. that regardless of what comes our way, because of that hopeful relationship we have God nurtured by His love, it should drive out whatever fear that would be yeah. as a result of things that come into our lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, another verse that uh, was important was that verse in Colossians one yes. fourteen. That's a yeah. good description. And, and I, I bring this one up because it's one that, um, 124, excuse me, the one that, how do you explain it? Mm -hmm. other than the Catholic understanding of redemptive that suffering. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Rejoice mm -hmm. in my sufferings for mm -hmm. your sake. In my flesh I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Oh yes, yeah. And you see that's, that's the mystery of the church is that in the same sense, you know, we, we have an awful lot of knowledge about the human body, but still when it comes down to it, I have a number of, of friends of mine who are doctors and for example, I went to one of them and I said to my friend, she's the chief of staff at the hospital where I, where I live, and she, I, said, um, I said, can you tell me what exactly, um, uh, for example, uh, Parkinson's is or uh, what, what exactly uh, various diseases are? And she says, well, that particular disease, we really don't know <laughs> what it is. And it's the same way about the body of Christ. We see that the Pope, with the bishops, you and I as laymen, we have our priests, we have our deacons, we have the mass. But the meaning of that is much greater than any single thing you can point to, or even the whole together, because the church is a mystery. And somehow, in the providence of God, your prayers and my prayers, our sufferings that we offer up to Christ are used to bring salvation, to bring healing, to bring consolation to people that might not otherwise be able to lay hold of those rich treasures of God. Now one of the amazing things that I, I like people to think about, because we, we, often, we often think in such limited ways, do you realize that God can use our prayers to answer the need of somebody in the past? For example, you know it says in Isaiah, I will call before you answer, or I will answer before you call upon me. If, if God lives in eternity and there is no time there, there's no sequence of events, then He can take a prayer that I utter on May the 8th, 1998, and He can use that and apply it to somebody that lived 5,000 years ago. Because the all-knowing, the eternal God can do that without any restriction of time. Now, if that's true, then how much more true can he apply it to souls today and souls in the wow. future? So as we give ourselves and truly embrace the cross, we never know the way in which God will use that to bring salvation to people. 
I wish I knew all the details of this story, but I remember a story about our Holy Father who once very early in the morning when he was praying, long before others usually awake in the Vatican, he fell. Do you know the story? No, I He don't. fell and I think he broke a leg or, or did something and he couldn't get up. And But rather than call to get help, he chose to lay there in pain and mm -hmm. wait. Mm -hmm. But during the time that he was laying there, he focused his whole prayers on that the suffering he was experiencing at that moment would have a redemptive, powerful mm. uh, benefit for the church. Okay. I mean, there our Holy Father is giving us a model of how we take that old phrase, offer it up, <laughs> yeah. a phrase which we never offered. <laughs> as We never not, understood We never understood it. No. But yet many Catholics, I think, today forget the power and the meaning of offer. What does it mean to offer it up? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, in the, it means a number of things, but, but one of them, for example, is for a Catholic, the Mass is the center of our life. That's the earthly experience of worship that unites us to heaven. And what that means is that the Mass is an offering. It's an offering of bread and wine. It's the offering of the sacrifice of Christ, which has come down to earth and now is offered back to the Father in heaven. And, what, and, you know, there's a phrase that I don't hear much today either in the Catholic Church, but it's an old Catholic phrase, and that is to assist the priest at the Mass. Hmm. Right? We're not just observers of some yeah. performer up there. We're joining our prayers with our priest to the sacrifice of the cross in the Mass hmm. offered up to God. And what that also means, as I learned by the grace of God very quickly, that I could bring all of my sorrows, all of my hurts, all of my pains, and I could offer them to God in the Mass. But then out of that experience, in an everyday way, whatever happens that is distasteful or that hurts us, we can offer that to God and say, Lord Jesus Christ, I unite that hurt to your cross. And oftentimes, I like to visualize it this, this way, that, you know, the thorns that went into Jesus' head, mm -hmm. no doubt you can think of them as like a, as like a funnel. Mm -hmm. And all of my sins going into that one thorn mm -hmm. into Jesus' head, mm -hmm. if my sins are what put him on the cross, mm -hmm. then how little is it of me to offer up whatever pain I've had mm -hmm. that his cross might redeem the world through my offering? In a very certain sense, every one of us is called to suffer. It, and mm -hmm. we accept that suffering that comes our way, sometimes seemingly very minor, but that's what God wills yeah. for us. Yeah. And for other people, that suffering can be m much greater. In fact, uh, we're v well aware in the Catholic Church, both presently and historically, of people who have maybe the charism of suffering called mm. suffering souls. Yes. We weren't very aware of those before we came into the church. Mm -hmm. Talk for a moment about uh, the life and maybe the meaning of those who are called to be suffering souls. Yes, I, I think that we, we often don't realize how many of those people may be out there. There are some, uh, I'd like to tell you the story that, that a number of Catholic friends know about. It's a little girl uh, in Massachusetts named Audrey Santo, mm. who when she was three years old, fell into the family pool and almost died. Hmm. She, in fact, became brain dead and lays in a hospital for the last 10 to 12 years. And there are many, many people hmm. who have experienced healing of the body and of the soul because of what Audrey has gone through. Hmm. There's visible evidence. For example, during the time of Lent, when little Audrey has had a terrible heat rash on her body, but the doctors could find no medical reason for that rash. And there are other times when there have been miraculous events happen in the context of Audrey's family. And part of it is that Audrey and her mother who cares for her are people who have given their souls up mm -hmm. to Jesus. Mm -hmm. As a very famous French theologian, Father René Laurentin says, we, all we know is that Audrey is a mystery, but somehow, perhaps in her soul, she has given her heart so completely to Jesus Christ that he has given her this suffering so that many people 
might find the healing of God's love and mercy in theirs. When we come back, we might address this issue of the more that we surrender to the Christ, often the more that we suffer. Mm. That's in, for many, that seems like a contradiction, mm -hmm. but yet it might be a real blessing in our life and for the, the value of the body. Stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment to take your phone calls and email messages to Ken about this important issue of redemptive suffering. Welcome back to The Journey Home. We're meeting tonight with Dr. Kenneth Howell. He's been sharing his journey, but, but we've been discussing the importance and the, the power and, and the real meaning of suffering in our Christian lives. And Ken, we ended just a moment ago on this issue of the relationship between our own surrender to Christ, our openness mm -hmm. to Him, mm -hmm. and, uh, and often how that then op may open us to the reality of suffering in our life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you mentioned as we were talking in the break, again, this, the powerfulness of accepting the cross. You had mentioned that earlier. I want you to talk mm -hmm. just a bit about that before we go to our first email. What does it mean to embrace the cross of Christ? You know, I, I think one of the most beautiful illustrations in Scripture is the story of Simon the Cyrenian, mm -hmm. who was walking along the, the Via Dolorosa. As Jesus was carrying the cross, you remember he fell, mm -hmm. of course, and then they took Simon and they made him carry, and in the way the gospel writer, St. Luke says it, it's beautiful. He says that, <clears throat> he says that they actually, that he came after Jesus. He followed after Jesus with the cross. Now that is a historical event mm. that has a deep spiritual meaning. Mm. Because what Simon did is what every one of us are called to do. Jesus is walking the way of sorrows to Calvary. Mm. We are asked to pick up the cross and to follow after Him. The emphasis is on Him. It's not just to sort of go out there and look, try to be heroic, you know, uh -huh. to, to suffer, but it's to follow Him. And if we follow Him, then that means being a willing, having a willingness to do whatever He calls us to do. You know, a friend of mine's brother is a Baptist pastor. And this Baptist pastor had a very great words of wisdom one time. He said, life is what happens to you while you're planning it. Okay? <laughs> right. And that's true, isn't it? There's so many things come into our lives that we don't expect, and yet that is what Jesus is asking us to do at that moment of our lives. And it's being open and sensitive to that and embracing it at the moment. If we focus on our cross, and tell everybody how rough it is to carry this cross, <laughs> yes. we miss the yeah. point of the cross. Exactly, exactly. It's like when Jesus talks about uh, fasting. We yeah. don't make it look how bad fasting right. is. Right. We make it such that no one knows that we're, that fasting, we're fasting because it's between God and us. Right. Mm -hmm. And really the essence of suffering is right in the midst of that. It's mm -hmm. between God and us. Mm -hmm. Our complaints, in fact, about things that happen are like slapping God in the face. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, yes. as opposed to mm. accepting and moving on. Now, I think this email, though, gets us into another aspect of this, which is very important. So let's take this email. Can we trivialize, trivialize the suffering of others if we focus solely on the redemptive power and not their pain? How do we appreciate the graces and still respect the truly human toil suffering can impose? That's an excellent question because that, in fact, is what we never want to do. Mm. We never want to trivialize the sufferings of others. 
Um, and that is very difficult as, an, a pastor, as a pastor, I can tell you. Mm. I had difficulty trying to help people to see the value of suffering, but not allow them to think that somehow I'm not taking seriously what they did. One of the reasons that I'm convinced that God allowed me to go through whatever suffering I have is to open my eyes and my ears to the sufferings of others. And that is a sign of, of true, true grace within the heart, like Mother Teresa has had, or many others. When we see human beings in suffering, our instinctive response should be try, to try to alleviate their suffering. But one way to alleviate that is to understand the meaning of that suffering. And the meaning of that suffering joined to the cross will, will give us courage to endure the suffering which in many cases cannot be alleviated by human means. There's nothing incompatible about praying for healing for someone and at the same time encouraging that person to accept whatever God brings as a result of those prayers. They shouldn't give up their hope to be healed. No, they shouldn't. Right. But at the same time, if God in His infinite wisdom chooses not to heal physically, mm. then we should say, Lord, then teach me the lessons, whatever it is that you want me to learn. Now, when we're dealing with others, we have to ask God for the grace to understand the difficulty and the pain. Mm. And that is one difference that I've noticed in my own journey. And I can't speak for others, but in my own journey from being a Protestant minister to being a Catholic, is that oftentimes as a Protestant minister, I was trained to, to give answers hmm. to people, you know, to say the right words. And I think now in my Christian life and, and my understanding of what the, the doctrine of suffering is about is that I don't have to give answers hmm. to every question. Sometimes the best answer is just to be there hmm. with someone. Which is a good way of describing even what we do in our work in the Coming Home Network International. Is, we yeah. don't have the answers for everyone, no. but maybe what we are called to do in that is to be there, to yeah. be there beside those that are contemplating the uh, conversion to the church, which can bring mm. suffering mm. into their lives, can bring suffering, along with the great joy that they receive yes. in coming home to the church. Right. We have a caller. Hello, what's your name and uh, what's your question for us this evening? Okay, my name is Joetta Anderson. and uh, Hello. You, hello. Hello, Joanna. Yes. Um, my question may have been answered somewhat already by what you've just talked about, but you were talking about answered prayer, yes. and I'm just questioning what about unanswered prayer? My husband just died recently of cancer, mm -hmm. and I and many, many people were praying for him, and it's, it's hard to make any sense of it. And that's my question. How can you help me make some sense of unanswered prayer? I think, thank you, I think that's a question that probably is on the minds of a lot of people because mm -hmm. especially when a loved one goes or something and, and, uh, and you wonder why, Lord? Uh, mm -hmm. What about all our prayers, the prayers of the, the church and the faithful? Mm -hmm. I think that, I don't know if you've ever seen, uh, Joetta, the, the movie Rudy, but Rudy, um, in that movie about the football player at Notre Dame, there's a scene in there in which Rudy says to the priest, have I done everything that I could? And the priest answers very wisely, says, praying is something we do in our time. God, the answers are something God gives in His time. Mm -hmm. And you see, the, the model for our prayer life is Jesus our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. We may come with our prayers and we may say, Lord, take this cup of suffering from me. But in, from one perspective, Jesus' prayer Himself his prayer was not answered because he was given that cup of suffering. Mm -hmm. But in another level, it was answered because he was given the resurrection to overcome that suffering. And even if we pray for healing, a person who dies, in a sense, experiences a greater healing than a person on earth. We pray with our intentions, with our time, with our understanding, but the greatest prayer that we can pray is, Lord, thy will be done on earth, in my life. You know, that's what Mary said. She just didn't say, let it be according to your word. She said, let it be to me, yeah. according to your word. 
Let your will be done in my life. It is, of course, extremely painful when anyone of our loved ones, I mean, I can't imagine what it would be like if my wife died because I love her so much. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that God has abandoned us at all. He certainly has not abandoned the one who has died. He brings that person to himself. It calls us to trust God and his wisdom and for us to recognize that as, as his mere creatures, we're, we don't understand this side of heaven. Yeah. I remember that old image of uh, Corrie ten Boom, used the, the old image of when she was a, a young girl, she would watch her mother do needlepoint, you know, and when mm -hmm. she looked at the bottom side oh, yes. of the needlepoint, it was just threads and everything hanging down in great disarray. But then when she got older and could look over her, her mother's shoulder, she could see the picture. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a part could of our be. journey. Yeah. In this life, we see things dimly, mm -hmm. but then we shall see face to face. We'll see clear, we'll understand. We'll understand why it appeared that our prayers went unanswered. But then we will see that all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to His purpose. God has mm -hmm. a plan mm -hmm. and, and works them out for what is best. We have another caller. Hello, what's your name and where are you from? Hello. Hello. Yes. I'm Felicia from uh, Florida. Hello, Felicia. What's your question for us tonight? Well. I have a, a Protestant friend, yes. and I had explained to her about the uh, importance of the uh, redemptive suffering. Yes. And she was trying to tell me that we don't have to suffer because Jesus did it all. Uh, he he can, he's the only one who can suffer because he is God. Yes. So when we are in the hospital and we are suffering, he said that uh, we shouldn't endure the suffering at all because it's not needed. Mm. What what can I tell her? And so I'll have to hang up and listen to your answer. Thank you for your question. Okay. Well, I suppose the most important thing um, that Felicia would have to ask her friend is that um, to, to show her the scriptures. And I, I trust that her friend does believe the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And we can go right back to the verse which you mentioned, Colossians 1.24. Paul says, I fill up in my body that which is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Now here's the great apostle Paul. If he had to suffer in order to fulfill God's work, why should we be exempt from doing the very same thing. Now the problem is, in a sense, her friend is right. Her friend says, Jesus suffered. But what the false conclusion from that is that that means that we don't have to suffer, yeah. you see. And because in fact, the fact that Jesus suffered on the cross, salvation is being drawn into the cross. Mm. It's, becoming a, it's becoming a participant in the cross. And it's being his instrument of the cross in other people's lives. If we shun the cross, no, first of all, if we shun suffering, then we're shunning the cross. And if we shun the cross, then how can we say with St. Paul that I'm crucified with Christ? It's not I who live, but it's Christ who lives within me. You see? There's another text in, in 2 Corinthians, the beginning, mm. that talks about this sharing of suffering and comfort and maybe even a reason why we go through it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction, so it assumes that we're going to be afflicted, yeah. but God's mercy is there, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction mm -hmm. with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly, <laughs> in Christ's sufferings. Yeah. So through Christ, we share abundantly in comfort too. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's our aspect of, which is a kind of controversial word today, but our aspect as co-redeemers with Christ, yeah. our suffering beside Christ, mm -hmm. with Christ. Under Him. Mm -hmm. Under Him, uh, in many ways, imparts in us an ability to comfort others in their suffering. See, Marcus, this is what most people do not understand. And, 
is the longer that I'm a Catholic, the more I understand this, that being a Christian does not mean just believing on a historical Jesus who died upon a cross. It is participating in what he did. In the mystery of God's salvation, his redemption, it's the realities of his life, of his death, of his resurrection, living today in the church, in the sacraments, in you and in me. And that's why suffering is something to be embraced rather than shunned, because that is how we have more of Christ within our lives. Why don't we go to this email? Boy, time okay. runs so quickly on this okay. show. Your story of never having suffered rings true. I feel the same way sometimes, and I find I almost envy friends their hardships and sufferings. Is this bad or dangerous? And should I heed their warning, be careful what you ask for? <laughs> what should I offer if not the suffering I don't have? Yeah. Then I would say offer the non-suffering that you have. <laughs> <laughs> offer the leisure. Offer the time. Um, none of us should pray for suffering in the sense of, of uh, something direct. Mm. But we should pray for the openness to that. The other reality may be that sometimes we may have suffering that we don't realize yeah. in our everyday lives. And it may be something very small. You're driving down the street and somebody cuts you off in traffic. You can offer that to God and say, you know, you get angry for a moment. Offer it to God, sure. you know. Uh, of course, the area of fasting oh, of course. involves Absolutely. our choice yeah. to receive suffering. Yeah, that, that's a beautiful illustration because, and you see, most people, I'm afraid, think of fasting just in terms of the food. But the fasting that God desires is the fasting of the heart. It's a self-denial that gives ourself completely to Jesus Christ. We just have a couple minutes, and I wanted to t give you an opportunity to talk briefly about your new book, which mm -hmm. uh, Mary of Nazareth, and in fact, the subtitle has to do with her place in, in our unity, yes. uniting the church. But uh, bringing up the aspect of Mary as our model of suffering, oh, a yeah. lady of yeah. sorrows. Yeah. How is Mary one to, we to look to as a model of suffering? In our well, this was the most amazing discovery to me. You know how, Marcus, we read the Bible for many years and yet we didn't understand certain things? Yeah. In Luke <laughs> chapter 2 and verse 34, the, the old man Simeon prophesies and says this to Mary when they're in the temple. He says, Behold, this one, this child, is set for the rising and falling of many in Israel and is a sign to be contradicted and a sword will pierce through your very soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. There it is. Mary experienced the suffering of Christ. She at the foot of the cross said to her Lord and our Lord, I suffer with you in my soul. And you notice what it says in the text? She did this so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. We do not know the power of our offering of our lives to God for the ability for people's hearts to be open to God. In fact, I'd like to say that maybe that more than all of our preaching and all of our teaching may open people's hearts is by the simple offering of our lives to the glory of God and to the work of His salvation. Ken, thanks so much. So good to for be being here. back on the show, yeah. getting a chance for us to be together again, yes. <laughs> you know, as buddies. And uh, uh, and I pray that your new book will have a great, uh, powerful impact on bringing many who don't understand who Mary mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. and uh, will help them in their own spiritual walk. But maybe in this particular, this, particularly in this issue of suffering, mm -hmm. will help many recognize uh, how suffering helps us grow in our own perseverance mm -hmm. as we walk in the journey. Thanks, mm. Ken. Good, thank you. Please stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment for some closing thoughts for the journey home.
Welcome back to The Journey Home. We've been discussing tonight the importance of suffering in our spiritual journeys. And as I thought I'd close tonight, we would focus on a few points of Scripture that remind us of the important place of suffering in our spiritual growth. The first I'd like to draw your attention to is in Romans 5, verses 3 through 5, when Paul writes, More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. He describes there the importance of suffering in our journey. As we grow in hope, it's built on the growth of our character, which is built on the growth of our endurance, which is built on our acceptance and our reception of suffering. This is exactly what Jesus is teaching in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. One of the early church fathers points out that the Beatitudes are to be understood as a ladder going from one to the next. And to grow in these Beatitudes, we begin at the first and then go to the next and go to the next. And the first of the Beatitudes is blessed are the poor in spirit. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? It means humility. It means detachment from things of the world, which involve suffering letting go. And then every single beatitude as we go up the ladder of spiritual growth involves an element of suffering. Blessed are those who mourn, for they are comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are hunger or thirst. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure of heart. Every aspect of our journey requires a sense of detachment, of accepting all that it is that God wants to give us. And you know that God knows better what you and I need than we do ourselves. In our prayers, we are to be as open to all that God wants to give us as He wants to give us, not necessarily as we want. As we grow in our spiritual journey, on our journey home to Jesus Christ, we are to accept more and more what He wants of us, what He wants of our marriages, what He wants of our vocation, what He wants of our of our children, because they are all gifts that He has given to us that we are then to be stewards of so that one day we present back to Him pure, perfected in love. That's what suffering helps us to do. Thank you for joining us. I look forward to being with you again next week on The Journey Home. Mm -hmm.